want to make sure I hit record here. Um, uh, and it's great to have you on today. And I want to thank you and Marilyn Relay for supporting our discussions this month. Um, uh, it's our pleasure, Steve. Thanks so much for this great opportunity. Great. Um, tell folks a little bit about Maryland Relay, what they need to know about the services that you provide and, and, and what it's all about. Sure. Um, so Maryland Relay is a free public service uh, provided by the uh, Telecommunications Access of Maryland program, which is under the Department of Disabilities. Um, we are a, uh, a free public service for individuals who have difficulty using a standard telephone. Uh, so that could be anyone who is living with uh, difficulties with hearing, vision, speech, mobility, uh, even cognitive dis difficulties. We also have an equipment program where we are able to provide uh, assistive technologies, um, telecommunications devices and accessories um, to anyone that qualifies at no cost to them. And that is our um, Maryland Accessible Telecommunications Equipment Program. Great. And what, uh, what defines somebody being able to take advantage of this? Do they have to have like a, a note from their doctor that says that they're hard of hearing or is this open to every all residents. So it is open to all residents that have difficulty using a telephone. And as part of our application process, uh, there is a form for a physician or a social worker, uh, even an audiologist uh, that can, they, they just certify that you have difficulties with hearing, vision, speech, whatever the case may be. Um, and that would be submitted with the application. Um, and that way you are certified as having a disability. Okay, great. And um, uh, now, this month is Deaf History Month. Um, I I know nothing about deaf deaf history. I, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but can you give a little nugget of uh, of deaf history for me and our audience who might not be well versed in this area? Sure, absolutely. Um, my degree actually is in deaf studies. And so um, deaf history, it, it, it's, it's a completely rich and beautiful culture. Um, and the history, um, in, especially in the United States, is just fascinating. Um, one little tidbit that I can share with you is everyone is familiar with Alexander Graham Bell. He is the advent, advent, inventor, tongue tied today. <laughs> Uh, he's the inventor of the telephone. Um, what people don't necessarily know is that growing up, his mother actually started to lose her hearing at age 12. And uh, by the time he was a little bit older, she was completely deaf. Um, his wife was also deaf. She lost her hearing at age five after a near fatal uh, bout of scarlet fever. Um, and he invented the telephone and many of the other acoustic inventions that he created um, to specifically design for people who are deaf. Um, obviously, the telephone doesn't necessarily work for folks who are deaf. Um, you need to be able to hear on the receiver. Um, so that was kind of a failed invention as far as his wife was concerned, but clearly we all benefited from it. Oh, wow. This is great. And hopefully we're going to have you on several times this month and we'll, you can give us additional historical nuggets. Now, the, um, uh, the link that I added into the chat there, this month, uh, we're going to actually have a discussion on March 25th about the Maryland Relay Partner Program. And uh, this is a great business opportunity for all of you in the audience who are in business to better serve the hard of hearing community in Maryland. And then also on, Mer on Wednesday, March 17th, you're hosting a webinar where if people are interested in learning more about um, Maryland Relay, they can jump on that. Absolutely, yes. Um, the, I believe the link is also in the chat. Um, feel free to register, um, particularly if you know someone who is struggling to use a telephone because of a hearing loss. We're going to talk about caption telephone and also remote conference captioning, which can actually provide captions for events like this one, like this discussion. Awesome. Well, Jenny, we'll definitely be seeing you at future discussions. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And um, the, I hope the audience reaches out and follows up with you for additional information. So, so thanks so much. Of course. And thank you, Steve, for this opportunity. Appreciate it. You, you bet. Okay. So I am going to take 
Jenny off the screen and I'm now it's time to get this discussion started. I've been looking forward to this for a while. So if I can ask our panel members to uh, uh, join us and um, as, they, as they walk to the stage, one of the things I love about this digital, these digital platforms is remember when we did live events and how long it took speakers to walk up to get to the microphone? That was like instant. This is fantastic. So um, today we're going to be learning about Stack Care. And, uh, but before we learn about Stack Care, let's learn about one of the people behind Stack Care, and that's Nigel Mould. Nigel, welcome. And before you run through your demo, tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to join the Stack Care team. Sure. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, good afternoon or, or good morning to everybody for, for those of you out on the West Coast. Um, my background, I, you know, I, I've been through a lot of different businesses and career. Um, and uh, I, I was actually one of the very first investors in, in what was called Stack Lighting a few years ago, which was very much uh, focused on looking at activities and having lighting that changed automatically. It was a great concept, but we ended up with a light bulb that cost like $35. So um, it, it was actually the technology was sold to Philips back in 2017, but Stack was very much focused then on activities within an enclosed space, spatial awareness, if you like. And, uh, you know, the, the board of Stack at that point asked me to take a look at it and see what we could come up with. Um, but I was going through something that an awful lot of other people were, which was aging parents and how do you keep an eye on them and how do you take care of them and how do you know what's going on? And, and the stress and concern and worry. And in my case, my parents across in the United Kingdom were thousands of miles away. Um, it's difficult to pop around or, or, or sometimes even to place a phone call to know what's going on. Um, but a number of us were like that. And it was actually our chief data scientist uh, at the time who said, hey, you know what? I'd love to use this to keep an eye on my parents and see what they're doing. And, and that's how all of this started to develop um, and, and, and grew into Stack Care the way we know it today which is learning each individual's patterns and behaviors and looking for those anomalies and atypical events that would then say, hey, is there something wrong here or is this what we would expect? And that kind of what, what got us here. Great, I love it. And we're, um, we've got two other people on the screen that everybody can see. We got Greg Bailey and Dr. Garner. And I am delighted uh, that, that you invited them here today, Nigel, because a lot of times when we're talking about innovative technology on this, these discussions, we don't have end users. And, and uh, I'm really charged up that you invited two end users who have used your platform to share their experience with, with us. But what I'm thinking is, how about you start with your demo and showing our audience what Stack Care is, and then Greg and Dr. Garner, feel free to jump in wherever, and um, we can meet you at the at the point that you start talking about how you uh, you use the platform. Sure, okay. sounds good. Let me um, hopefully share my screen up here. You should be able to yep. see me yep. there now. Yep, that looks all good. good. So. Um, I think I probably would like to focus on the output, but um, I, I'm going to give you a little taste of, of the background and what Stack does. Um, our expertise was in data science, um, the passive monitoring that comes with that, device control, and a notifications platform. And you know, I can always go into a lot of that in detail and talk about the technical stuff that our engineers do for hours, but. Essentially, what we're looking at is um, input from devices. And this is using the same simple technology that opens the supermarket door for you or, or the, at the grocery store or at the gas station. It's infrared detection, um, looking at the motion, but using machine learning and artificial intelligence to look at those individual patterns and behaviors. 
and learning each person separately. So it might be that I sleep through the night and never get up at all. Um, but it might be that Steve gets up twice a night. So if I got up one night two or three times, that would be unusual for me, but wouldn't be unusual for him. And this is why we look at individual patterns and behaviors. Um, and uh, you know, we developed a lot of our in-house data science looking at things like that to try and understand what was what was going on there. And then we provide the feedback through our notifications platform, uh, particularly via app. But I'll talk a little bit later on about what we're doing now for uh, communities and for home care agencies as well. So in simple terms, um, yeah, these small sensors um, send their information every few seconds through a gateway to the internet up to the cloud where we do our magic and push it all the way back to the caregiver. And just to give you an idea of the time on this, um, if, if somebody pushes a help button, which we have a, an, a reactive button, if somebody feels that they need to call, um, as, as well as the passive monitoring, but to get from there to uh, the caregiver in general terms is less than two seconds. Um, takes a, a maximum, even if you have a poor cell phone signal, generally we're looking at three to seven seconds. So it's very fast reaction time and, and updating our system in real time on there as we go forward. So what do these things look like? Um, they are pretty small. We make them as, as discreet as possible. Um, the infrared motion sensor is about a couple of inches high and about an inch wide. Um, and uh, even the help buttons, actually we've now moved to offering people a nice little green friendly sticker on the help buttons because the see, uh, see, seniors don't always like seeing the word help on there. Um, but a, a gateway about four inches square, small, it's discreet, unobtrusive, um, and uh, placed up and, uh, up and out of the way or under a piece of furniture so that you don't get to see the gateway. It doesn't get unplugged by accident there. So what does it do? Um, well, as I mentioned, we, we're looking at essentially at, at response, improved care response, and trying to get to folks ahead of um, the emergency so that you know when something is developing, when a situation is developing, and, and, and giving you some clues as to what's going on there and alerting you to the times where you may need to check in or respond to a developing situation. Um, the, and the practical aspects, it's all quick, easy, simple to install. Um, it's a, just a case of download the app, um, plug in the gateway, set it up for your own home by allocating the sensors to the rooms and popping them up on the wall. First time out, it's done in less than 10 minutes for people who've got a little experience in terms of doing the installations. Uh, I, I can do them in less than five minutes at this point. Um, so it doesn't take long, it's easily done, and you don't need any outsiders coming into the home um, in order to set that up there in any case. So um, what sort of things are we looking at here? Um, typically things in terms of sleep patterns. Um, is there a change in pattern? And, and none of these are necessarily telling you what's right or wrong. It, it's not right or wrong if somebody has 15 or 20 bathroom visits in a day. Um, it's the changes there which may be indicating whether there's a problem or not. So the same type of thing goes for sleep. Some people need a solid eight or nine hours every day and others could be very happy with six or seven. But we're also looking at critical events such as where somebody has got up in the night, um, not returned to bed um, or is not sleeping in bed or hasn't got out of bed in the morning um, and potentially giving early warnings for poor sleep environments. Um, bathroom usage uh, you know, changes in the, the number and the frequency duration of bathroom usage um, it becomes an important factor. When we're not feeling well, we tend to visit the bathroom a lot. We tend to spend a lot of time in bed. Uh, and so getting an early warning on those can be really, really important. And then general activity. Um, 
whether that's the amount of activity, the time of day there's activity, whether somebody is actually using the kitchen, uh, whether they've, they've been in there opening the refrigerator, um, this type of thing. Um, and in CCRCs, we've even, um, for some folks, uh, introduced stairway overstays. Um, when residents, particularly around dinner times, um, elevators get full pretty quickly and people start taking to the stairs. So, um, you know, nursing staff want to know if somebody gone into the stairway and not left again, um, things like that. Um, it was interesting early on catching a few people taking smoking breaks in stairways um, in, in some buildings. But uh, it, it's amazing what you find out when you start to look at activity behaviors um, on things like that. And last but not least, the sensors, because they're PIR, also get to measure humidity and temperature. Um, which can become critical. And you know, last summer, we had a number of calls out on the West Coast um, with the heat waves that were going on there, seniors that weren't turning on their air conditioning. Um, and uh, in, in the winter, we had a call, uh, one notification went off up north where a senior had actually, she thought she'd closed her bedroom window um, and it just opened it for a moment, um, but it had swung open again and she went to bed. Um, our system saw the temperature drop uh, 40 degrees in, in, in about 10 minutes. Um, if a notification had not gone off on that, um, you know, she may well have ended up suffering from hypothermia during the night. So you can catch all sorts of things there, not just in terms of human behavior, um, but also in terms of environmental um, some of this, I think, might be a good place here, actually, to bring in, in one of our um, early users, uh, that's Greg Bailey. Um, his mom, um, and I apologize to Greg for calling his mom a canary, but she was one of what we called our early canaries. Um, these were people who were helping us um, validate the system, where we were looking at, at behaviors and patterns and making sure that this was something that was, we were sending out the right messages, um, that we were picking up the right activities. Um, and Greg, I think, you, you know, um, feel free to um, talk about the good, the bad, and the, the, the hopefully more good than bad um, of Stack, because I think you were on the receiving end of a couple of these early notifications as well. No, absolutely. and. Uh... It's an absolute uh, privilege to be on the panel. Uh, my name is Greg Bailey. I'm based in Seattle, Washington. And as Nigel alluded to, we were, I believe, actually the first ones or some of the first ones to start uh, using Stack Care. My mother lives in the Bay Area in California, approximately about 1,300 miles away. Um, we both were very enthusiastic about it is because we are a family that stays in touch quite a bit, but my mother lives by herself. She's 82 years young. Um, she is probably atypical than most. Uh, prior to COVID, she uh, did water aerobics. She's a church secretary. And so she has a very active lifestyle and she's very proud of that lifestyle and her independence. Um, we have found, and I specifically as an adult child, I've really found it to be a godsend because one of the components that I, I think everyone on this panel and everyone probably listening that uh, if we have children, we will be to the point where we are with our parents. We will be adults that have adult children that are looking to stay in touch and to make sure that um, we're all in good stead. And there's really the pride factor. My mother's a very prideful person. So she was really interested in this because she was able to keep her independence, not feel like she was a burden to us, but yet we'd be able to um, have a real good understanding of, of uh, just how she was doing in the home environment. Um, we look at in particular, and I do on the notifications, for instance, uh, my mother has a, a very steady regimen. She typically gets up the same time of day. She typically has the frequency of bathroom about the same time, and she typically cooks breakfast at the same time. And so when we see those anomalies or that, and I get a notification, it is very simple to just pick up the phone and to call. And uh, one occasion, which I think I had discussed with Nigel, is that uh, my mother had a bathroom frequency of roughly about, I believe it was 11 or 12. 
when she normally has three. And so my thought was something's wrong here and I must immediately call. And so I called, I couldn't reach her. I called again, I couldn't reach her. I called again and she picked up in church and she actually was in the choir and left the choir in order to say, hey, what's going on? And I'm like, no, what's going on with you? And that's when she told me that she had had to rush and was frequently going back and forth to the bathroom in order to prepare. But it, it wasn't a stressful thing because she appreciated me following up and we actually laughed about it. But there have been other occasions where the temperature, as Nigel has alluded to, my, my mother is very comfortable with a certain temperature and all of a sudden I started seeing her uh, room get exceedingly hot and I called her and it actually turned out where she wasn't feeling well and she wasn't feeling well enough to get to turn off the, uh, the heater. Since we have gotten Nest so she can control whatever by the phone, but it ended up being a call that I made on behalf of her to the doctor and uh, we were able to curb a, a potential um, infection that was proceeding. So there are a lot of things that, that just as an adult child and being remote 1,000, 1,300 miles away, that I really appreciate being able to see and to know about my mother without being invasive and without making her feel like um, she's dependent upon us. It is a wonderful tool. Um, there's, there's nothing that we can say that is lacking. Um, I did notice that there was a health facility which I was unfamiliar with and that would be a godsend as well. If there are any questions, feel, feel free. Thank, thanks, Greg. And we, we should, we, we'll, uh, I'll talk to you afterwards. We'll get you some of those help, help buttons and then okay. get, get over to your mom in any case. But yeah, I just wanted to show up again some of the, some of the way that the notifications and, and the technology gets fed back to, to a single user. Um, and you start off with a, with a pretty simple dashboard, but you can flick through the screens from that dashboard which will show you where the issues are, um, whether it's the sleep hours, you can see the previous seven days, the number of bathroom visits, both day and night. Um, you've got an, a gradient bar that will indicate if you're getting off your individual scale. Um, and you've got activity maps, which is showing where you are and also the latest status at, at any given point in time. You know, if, if uh, uh, it's often just reassuring to look at the activity page and see that mom or, or dad, um, in my case it was, that is, is still up and moving around and you get to see that they're following the daily pattern on there um, in, in any case. Um, and the kind of notifications that we were talking about and that, that Greg was mentioning there are things like um, the up and about check in the morning, but also looking at the different types of night bathroom usage. Um, our technology, the way it works today, I can tell you, um, it, it, you know, if you're over 75 and between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. and you have a bathroom visit exceeding 13 minutes, can tell you already there's a 98% likelihood of a problem. Um, and it's things like that that we've been validating over the last few years that we feed into our data science um, to look at whether it's the, the frequency of bathroom visits at night, whether it's the amount of time spent or the total time spent. Um, also a typical problem, night activity. Does somebody get up, uh, go somewhere and not come back to bed? Um, or day activity monitors, has somebody gone out, left, um, or even just gone out of range and out in the backyard and not come back into the house? Um, things like that. Um, uh, that, that, that we pick up um, and uh, the help button uh, on here as well is that if somebody presses the help button it immediately jumps forward to uh, the front um, of your dashboard will flash up there issues an alert chime on your phone that goes on for um, 15 quite annoying seconds until you actually open it up and have a look at it there. Um, tells you where the button was pressed, what time it was, and shows you an activity map. Um, so you can look at, uh, look at those type of things. Um, and here at Stack, we figure that not all um, notifications should be negative. So it, it, every day, um, if you enable this, and you can turn any of these on or off individually, 
we will send you a daily update just telling you that your resident, your mom, whoever it was, um, what time they were up and about, how long the sleep duration was, number of bathroom visits yesterday and last night, whether that was typical. Um, so, you know, with a, a lot of these type of things, I'd also like to hand a word over to, to Dr. Kyle Garner. Um, we met a number of years ago, but um, I know Dr. Garner was looking at a number of different systems, um, and I'm going to ask him to share some of his experience um, without putting down any of our competitors, but, but a number of different systems and, and uh, what eventually turned him on to, to stack care, Dr. Garner. Uh, thanks, Nigel. Steve, thanks for putting this together. It's been, uh, you know, this has been a kind of an interesting journey for me. Um, to give you some background, uh, my mother is in her late 70s. Um, she used to live in Virginia and um, she was caring for her mother uh, who was 100 years old. And when uh, my grandmother passed away, she decided to come down here. And my mother was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease uh, probably about 10 years ago, so maybe a little more. So she's kind of in the moderate to medium late stages of Parkinson's. And when she came down here, her sister moved with her. So she had some re resources, but she still wanted to maintain that independent living. And we really wanted to find something that could help her try and maintain that without being overly intrusive. And, you know, I looked at several different options, you know, the, the camera monitoring was really intrusive and, and nobody wanted their privacy invaded in that form. And we looked at a couple of other options that just didn't really seem to do anything more than just motion capture and you had to end up kind of doing your own self analysis. And when Nigel and I talked about what we were really looking for, he, he brought this to my attention and it kind of really fit exactly what we wanted. Something that helped me kind of unobtrusively make sure that my mom was still able to be functional and independent, that uh, clearly, you know, with Parkinson's, a fall risk was an issue. And her just basic ability to complete her daily living activities, or her ADLs, was really, really important. And I think that's what this kind of met that perfect little niche for us. Uh, and, you know, and I too have gotten the notifications from my mom regarding, uh, you know, increased bathroom visits here just this week, I noticed it. And I reached out and called her, how you feeling? And, and she said, not too great. Uh, it's been a tough time. And we talked about it, walked through it. And, you know, sometimes it's just, emotional support that the that the my mom needed sometimes it was uh making sure that she was still up and moving around my aunt doesn't live with her she lives in another neighborhood and if my aunt can't get in touch with her she wants to make sure that my mom is up so i get a note and i can look on my app and say yeah mom's up and she's moving around her activity's normal she was just in the living room and that helps to reassure all of us that she's doing okay. And I think that's been one of the great pieces of mind uh, for us here as this has gone forward. Yeah, cool. thanks, Carl. And, and one of the things there uh, that, that we, we introduced early on at Step Care was also allowing the creation of care groups. So, it, you know, in my case, uh, you know, with, with, with my father, with my parents, my, my sister could be on the same group. And so she could just open up her phone and she gets to see the same things that I see. And we could even use the app to send messages back and forwards to each other. Have you seen this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm responding to a call on there. Um, but we also both found, and I think similar to some of the things you were talking about, sometimes it is just a, a call in um, and because we see something and other times it's like, well, you know, uh, it's a chance to actually talk about something else um, on there as well. Um, what I, Steve, can I show one quick screen? Oh, sure. And I've got a, a couple, some questions are coming in, sure. but actually before you share your screen, um, this kind of ties into the question that sure. I'll be sharing shortly, but is uh, both Dr. Garner and Greg, uh, their uh, loved ones were at home. So this is, basically installed in a private residence. But uh, one of the questions relates to 
Is this something that uh, senior living communities or home care agencies are utilizing um, as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, this is a, a slightly different view on uh, notifications. We actually started off in with home care communities um, and, and uh, sorry, with CCRCs and then going on to home care agencies. Our problem was about a year ago, of course, um, uh, you know, COVID was released in, uh, upon us and uh, most uh, nursing homes, senior communities had their doors closed. So we started working more with home care agencies. But what we do is allow you to have multiple residents and even multiple communities um, and doing the same type of thing, uh, <clears throat> showing the same uh, alerts, but for communities and for agencies, you're actually able to uh, have an assigned responder on there, um, which then the system logs the times that everything has happened, who responded, what the results were. And we have it both from a web portal as well as from an app and tablet perspective as well. Um, and the ability to look at, at history on there for communities, um, as well as seeing all of their active notifications. And you get this, um, uh, you know, um, the matchup between web and mobile as well, so that everybody sees exactly what they're doing in, in real time there. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing that at this point, but yes, um, we have a number of um, partners, both sometimes independent, and, and there's a few folks that we're working with as well. Um, you know, one of our early adopters was um, one of the Bright Star communities out in Marin County. Um, in the Bay Area, but there's other folks we're working with from Canada to Florida to here in the DC area as well. Right. Yeah, well, the, the question from Mark Pfeiffer is, how does the product work when the CCRC or life plan communities Wi-Fi or power goes out? So um, if you have a power outage um, or a Wi-Fi outage, the system notifies you immediately. So literally within seconds. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that in itself proved a, a value early on. One of our earlier uh, clients um, saw that his grandmother's system went offline, um, checked in and found out that all of her power was out and was able to go over and see her. But you will know immediately if things go out so that you're then able to either check in on the resident or place a call, you know, assuming the cell towers aren't out completely and you know, things like that, yeah. Great, and then a lot of these, I, I, I remember the first generation of sort of sensor detection, I don't know what we call this category. It was rather complicated. Like the, the, some of the products that were out there, you actually had to have somebody come in and install the sensors and check everything out. You had mentioned that this is easy enough to do in five minutes. Could you kind of go into how are these sensors attached and connected and, and how is it that, th that this product is so easy? And out of, also to that, out of curiosity, did Dr. Garner or Greg, did you guys do the installation what would you do if somebody needed, um, like, let's say that I've got a family member in California and I'd like this installed, but I can't be there to do it. Um, is there a team that could help with that? Sure. Um, if, first of all, from, a, from a, a, an installation perspective, um, it's literally plug it in and connects via Bluetooth to your phone for the installation and you just follow the videos on the phone. And it's literally, now you've done this, click next, and, and it walks you through step by step. Um, so, you know, that's pretty simple. The connection of the sensors to the gateway is a Zigbee wireless protocol um, with a 28 to 30 digit um, security randomly allocated codes, uh, security level on there. That gives you about 150 trillion trillion combinations if anybody ever tried to hack one. It's unnecessarily secure, but we wanna make sure that nothing interferes with it. 
Um, Dr. Garner actually installed himself. So I'm, I'm going to let him give a user comment on that. Oh, that yeah, I, yeah, it was actually really quite simple. I, I could have probably had my daughter uh, install it too. I mean, from a simplicity standpoint, anybody that has uh, like, you, like Nigel said, uh, uh, a smartphone can basically do an app. The system is very easy to walk through. Um, I, you know, I had one little tiny snafu because, uh, you know, to turn on the little devices, you got to pull the battery and you're supposed to do it in a kind of a, a sequence. And I jumped ahead because I wasn't watching the video well enough. And, and so I, I kind of messed things up, but I called Stack Care and, and, and they got back to me within minutes and really walked it, walked through it with me and got me all set up. The process really could not have been easier. Um, and he recently, uh, Nigel was kind enough to send a couple of help buttons to me uh, just because my mom is starting to have some issues with some falls occasionally. And so having a little bit of a, a notification, ability to notify me if she ever gets in trouble is great. And so, uh, you know, again, we came in, I uh, basically pulled them out turned them on, my system recognized it immediately, I put them up exactly where they needed to be, and they were up and running. So it's a very, very simple user-friendly system to, to use and do yourself. That's great. Yeah. And we, um, we always aim that all, all of the complicated stuff should be behind the scenes. That's what we should be doing for you. That, that's always our, our mantra on this. Um, given that it is very easy to, I mean, in one case, I think we had an 82 year old actually install it themselves. but. For anybody who's smart, you know, savvy enough with a smartphone, as a phone as Dr. Garner said, I, I think could easily do an install. Um, we do group installations um, for CCRCs. We will send somebody. Um, and for home care agencies, we usually work with, if we can't get there ourselves, we'll just work with somebody from the work market or smart source, one of the IT groups, just to send somebody in because it goes so fast and so easy. Um, Great. Not a problem. Yeah, 10 minutes really is a, is exactly about what it takes to put up. So it's it's really quite simple. Great. Um, Anne Marie has an interesting question is what if there's a mom and dad in the same house and the kid wants to observe both of their habits? How does the system work with some a situation like that? Sure. Uh, the system aggregates uh, on something like that. So it tends to um, everything works the same way. But if somebody is stuck in the bathroom in the middle of the night, I can't tell you who it is, but I can tell you that there's a problem there. Um, and because we don't have wearables, we don't have cameras, we don't differentiate between people, the system can't see whether you're your uh, 200 pound uh, you know, ex linebacker or, uh, or an 80 pound grandmother. Um, it doesn't tell the difference. So, you know, from a point of view of that, it's specifically designed for uh, seniors living alone, which is increasing majority of us, um, but it works just fine with a couple. It's just a question of saying, well, you know, I can place a call and say, is one of you having problems here? You know, and, you know, and it might be mom saying, in my case, mom saying, yes, that, that's your dad. Um, where the problem is, but the system won't tell me who it is. And, and as I always say, being that it can't see you, you can wear those lime green pajamas in the middle of the day. The system makes no judgments, right? That's great. And I think that, you know, one of the appeals of this system is that the user has to do wear or do nothing in that, like, if you really wanted to identify that it was dad getting up and mom, you know, that would require the user having to wear a wristband or some kind of device to make that distinguish. Uh, right, and I, and I think it's important. I mean, uh, Greg, Greg may, may comment there as well, but I, I think, you know, a lot of our users really kind of appreciate that it's so discreet, they actually forget it's there. You know, I, I don't know how your mom looks at that, Greg. It, you remember it's, it's in there? It, it's a wonderful invisible safety net. And it does increase her uh, level of security. And um, again, as I said, um, the fact that it is seamless and, and unintrusive, it, it really makes a fundamental difference. She would not, as I think most most uh, seniors, w would not appreciate cameras, would not appreciate anything that invasive. She, it's truly seamless. And on many occasions, I think she actually kind of forgets it's there. 
And I think that's the ideal win, that it really is a safety net that you don't have to think about, but you know it's there. Great. Um, let's see, got some more questions coming in. Teresa Reinhardt says, can, can or does it adjust reporting incidents if a person's normal routine changes uh, for example, if they start drinking more in the evening, so more overnight bathroom visits becomes their new normal. Yes, that's a straight answer. It, it, it adjusts over time to, to your individual norm. Yeah. Okay, but like what might happen there is, let's say mom is, is drinking more um, and she's going to the bathroom more frequent. Um, you would touch base with her and yes this is this is if you've got like most of us we're going to decline our rates we're going to slow down right and and typically for most of us that means over time we may increase bathroom visits and things like that if you have a short term i'm talking you know, two three four days you get a change there and you know one of the things that that we've shown up frequently um uh, is um and I think I've got one slide here that I can just quickly show you. Um, this is what, for example, um, bathroom visits look like um, with an individual here. Um, this was in our validation days where we were looking at total time spent in the bathroom, which is the, the purple lines, the cerise lines at the bottom. And as you see, we got to about um, two, a third of the way through the month and uh, the, the number of hours spent in the bathroom suddenly doubled from average. Um, hmm. We alerted the community, this was at a CCRC, um, and uh, you know, they checked in, the resident said she was fine. It happened again the next day, the resident said she was fine. On the third day, she admitted that, yes, she had a problem and it was identified she had a UTI. And in fact, you see on the fourth day, she actually spent 12 out of 24 hours in the bathroom. Hmm. But, you know, it, as those of you, if anybody's ever had a UTI or knows anything about them, once you get your antibiotics, things drop back to normal within about 24 hours. I see Dr. Garner nodding. He's much more expert than me. Um, this and, is actually and she been made back to normal. Yeah, this has actually been something my mom has had a little bit of. And, and you know, just this past week, like I said, I got a notification. She's had, uh, you know, some more bathroom visits. This is exactly the situation. She's b battled a few UTIs over the past, oh, you know, maybe six or eight months. And, you know, getting this kind of early warning notification has helped to kind of keep her from getting to the point uh, where she decompensates. You know, we see this so much, so often in elderly patients that they may not know or have the kinds of symptoms that maybe a, a younger population may get. And uh, they kind of live with it for a little bit longer, but they also become much more ill and it becomes a much more serious illness for elderly population. So it's nice to get these warnings, to get these little pushes and allows us as not a provider, but as a caregiver to jump in and say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Are you eating okay, drinking okay? It's just that little nudge for us to, to make sure they're doing all right or encourage them to seek additional care. Hey, let's let's take you to go see the doc and have them check you out, see if there's anything we can head off before it gets to be a problem. The, um, you know, on that previous screen that you shared, one element that I really liked from a senior living community perspective is the vacant bar. So you're able to track when the, the person is leaving their apartment and they're outside in the community. And yeah. again, for those of us who are um, care, you know, adult children worried about mom, seeing mom sort of staying in her apartment more than she usually does. Uh, although, you know, again, COVID-19, we're wrenching this, but when we get back, I, I like that from a trackable perspective for a community. Um, uh, nice little feature there. Um, yes, we, we found in working with, with a number of CCRCs, but th th there was a few of them where you really saw that um, there was only about one third of the population that actually got involved in the daily activities, whether it's, you know, an afternoon club of some sort or a movie night or, um, you know, there's, there's community events. Um, and it's interesting to see then how much time residents are spending isolated, pre-COVID, of course, isolated in their apartments 
and whether you actually want to start to look at changing the events to get people more involved in an active lifestyle. Yeah, or, you know, working with those residents and creating some customized activities for them that I, you, I can see the value of this, especially since it's unobtrusive, you know. Yeah. Um, the, um, Teresa has another question follow up to that, that does the user see what their normal routine is? This can be helpful if a person is transitioning from total independence to needing some type of home care aid and services. Yeah, I can see where, you know, it's one thing if just, you know, the outside group of advisors like the family members and staff or the home care agency knows, but making it transparent so that the user can see that information and it's like, geez, I'm, um, I'm spending a little bit more time in my apartment or I you know, um, I never realized that I get up three times each evening to go to the restaurant. And, and, and the simple answer is, is yes, particularly if the resident or, 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 or your relative, the senior has a smartphone, they can actually be on the cable and see themselves on there. And, and in a lot of cases, we know that people like to see that and even they're looking at their own sleep hours and this sort of thing. Um, and of course, we occasionally have the, the, the kind of slightly humorous situation where somebody will look at it and say, I never have 17 bathroom visits in 24 hours. And we say, count it, count is a, because a bathroom visit doesn't necessarily mean you're going using the toilet. We're looking at, you know, you may just be going to brush your teeth, right? So what we're looking at is changes in the patterns. But once people start to count it, they go, yeah, actually you're right. I was in the bathroom 17 times yesterday, but it, it's, it's the changes in there, or as you saw, you know, Greg was talking earlier about that case with his mom where he suddenly sees 11 bathroom visits at night and early in the morning, but it turned out, you know, that she's rushing off to church. But it's looking at those things which are going, hey, is there a problem over here? Um, and, and giving people a heads up, an early heads up on it. Okay, well, I was waiting for uh, these questions to come and they came in fast and furious from Brad and uh, someone else is, what is the, can you go over the cost? How much does this does this system cost? Sure. Um, well, uh, straight from our website for individuals, um, it's a, it, it's a thirty nine ninety five basic package. Um, we supply the equipment, um, and uh, that's like a monthly subscription. You can save money on an annual subscription. Um, but we work particularly with home care agencies um, and providing a slightly different service to them. And with depending upon volume, um, pricing can come down for them. And particularly with CCRCs, um, you know, get significant volume in there, then, then the price range comes down. Yeah. And of course, like a, a home care or a CCRC life plan community could um, choose to just offer this to all of your residents, or it could be an optional thing where they they could pass on the cost and, and yeah typically with with the ccrc they like to see it for everybody because they can see them all on the screen you don't have gaps if you like in your coverage but home care agencies may just be for those vulnerable ones so the ones who are more vulnerable from a health perspective um uh, and uh, or you know we we have some who offer it just as a straight up service but um and the, the fam for the fact they sell it onto the families um, and some who are, are, most of them are saying, look, we, you know, we put this in and we will respond to it. So if mom needs help in the middle of the night, we'll send somebody. And, and so there's a lot of flexibility in terms of the way that particularly care providers can use it. Have, um, uh, have the, another question regarding, is there any sort of type of insurance or program that uh, can uh, help pay for this? Uh, yes, um, uh, this is uh, Medicaid eligible in 48 out of the 50 states, um, uh, which of course is, is a, a, you know, dependent upon Medicaid eligibility uh, there, but particularly if you paste recipients, that type of thing, and uh, maybe oh. we'll be eligible for it in any case. Well, yeah, what a, what a great, uh, very affordable platform for Medicaid to cover for somebody who's homebound and um, needs some monitoring. That would be great. Okay, so let me get back to the, uh, I'm going to jump back up to the, the top of the list. Uh, Susan Bloom, who is an aging life care manager, um, and I could see where this application 
could be helpful for their clients. She says, does the system have fall detection capability or is that determined more by the change of the activity pattern? It's determined more by the change of the activity pattern. Um, and and that's, that's the type of thing where typically you're looking at um, uh, you know, bathroom overstays, bedroom overstays, activity being centered in one place where the resident isn't, isn't moving. Um, it changes in pattern there. So that's why we always talk about, I mean, a lot of people like to talk about fall detection. Um, and in reality, it, it's more of what we say, which is potential falls, because we're going, here's a change in, in pattern behavior timing that indicates a problem. We don't have a camera in place to tell you what the problem is, but if we think it's severe enough, we're going to send you, a, you know, what we call a hard notification, which your phone is going to bing, you're going to get the notification on the front screen um, and telling you that it needs checking in. Yeah. Great. And then um, Mark Pfeiffer says, so this system precludes the need for a help pendant around the neck. Yes, I mean, help pendants, I think, have, have, a, have a place. Um, one of the issues with help pendants, and you look at the old NIH study is saying that, you know, um, only one in seven owners actually wear them. Part of the problem is you don't want to wear it in bed at night. If you're getting up to go to the bathroom, do you remember to put it on? Do you remember to keep batteries charged and this sort of thing? Um, and, you know, our buttons here, we kind of make them small enough, but but big enough, the whole button is actually the device. You don't have to press it at one point, you can hit it anywhere. Um, and we mount these on the walls, typically about outlet height, you know, 16 inches above the floor. So that if somebody falls over, they can just reach over or roll over and press it. Um, and and the, the, you know, that sends out an instant loud notification to, to the user's phone. Um, and so you know, even somebody, like Dr. Garner's mother there, who may be suffering from, from Parkinson's, you don't have to push something specific on here. You can just mash it as many times as you like, hit it once, nudge it, whatever you want to do. And, you know, and it's interesting, you spoke to the, you know, the issue of the fall pendant and things like that. That's been, you know, I, the previous system that I had, had one of those and my mother never wore it, I, never. And, and, and I would encourage her and think about that again, because she is at risk for falls. And it really became something that she, was just absolutely useless. We kind of obviated that a little bit by getting her an Apple Watch. And they do have some fall detection against it's not perfect. Uh, but that combined with this other system kind of gave her again that little sense of safety uh, that that she needed and that we needed to feel like she was still in an environment that was okay for her to be independent. I would agree with, with Dr. Gardner. We went to, through the same path. My mother actually never took it out of the box. <laughs> and so, right. and so, and I couldn't get a refund. And, and it is typically older antiquated, antiquated uh, items as it were with usually some type of recurring or upfront monthly monitoring and then you have to depend on another level of individuals of professionalism hopefully that they will respond accordingly and we went through the apple watch iteration so to hear about the help button itself um i know my mother will be excited and i'm excited about it just a, another layer of, of a safety net that i think she would actually use as opposed to a wearable and it's also yeah. great that it's also great that it's not something that they're afraid to push because sometimes people are afraid to yeah. push because it's going to call 911 and next thing you know there's all these people coming in in you know ambulances and whatever this is something that's personal it's self-contained it's a way to reach out to me or her sister in a way that is keeps it private keeps it independent if they need to get assistance we can then initiate that process uh, or, um, you know, we can reach out to somebody who's in mom's community to go check on her. That's great. Uh, but it, it's it, that kind of, again, privacy really is really important for these patients who are still patients, mom, uh, <laughs> who are still in, uh, still in their facility or in their home. Well great. said. We got a couple more questions. And whenever I do that, uh, a few more come in, but we're 
we're winding down to the top of the hour. And uh, let's see, Ron Swanda says, this sounds like a system that would be very attractive to many of the aging in place villages. Do you have any of the villages that have uh, sort of looked into this for their members? Um, we've got a few looking at it. Um, one of the restricting factors over the last 12 months has, has of course been COVID and the ability of people to get together. Um, uh, and uh, we, more of our demand so far has been, and particularly the last year has been very much home care agencies. And as vaccination uh, distribution is, in, is increasing and spreading, so we're starting to see CCRCs open up and we're starting to hear more from uh, virtual villages and things like that as well. So I, I think there's gonna be more of that coming towards us. Great. The, uh... Paul Nasto, who is with a home care agency, says, can the system send an alert for inactivity? Yes. Yeah, we have uh, both a daytime and nighttime activity monitor, and you can customize the amount of time setting for each person. Um, and so even if they go outside of range of the sensors, um, we had a story um, uh, the, 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 you know, from somebody that our, our business development director knows of where a relative of theirs had fallen down the basement stairs and actually laid there for three days before being discovered. They didn't have the stack system, but if they'd had stack in place, they would have seen at least, hey, there's been no activity for X hours, you know, uh, or, or minutes, depending upon the sensitivity level that you've got it set for. But yes, works both for nighttime and daytime separately and you can set the, the hours um, and, and the length of period you're looking for an activity. Great. Well, this is about as perfect timing as we can get, which we, it's uh, uh, at the top of the hour. I really want to appreciate uh, all three of you for joining us and it, what a wonderful demo. And I really, I really appreciate Dr. Garner and Greg jumping in because Hearing your perspective as a user, I think just helps us understand this, this bit of technology from a more authentic place. And uh, I, I think that's very important. So um, uh, I really appreciate it. Got lots of uh, good comments and feedback and I'll make sure to send a, uh, the recording, a transcript of the chat, but contact information for Nigel and his team in case you'd like, uh, uh, deeper dive into this, or you're interested in a demo for yourself or your loved ones. I think um, this is a really cool piece of technology, and it you know at forty dollars a month, that is uh, really affordable. I think the other platforms that I remember looking at in the uh, with sensors were were much more expensive. Um, so. Yeah, and I'd like to thank you, Steve, um, uh, for the opportunity here. Also point out that um, we know, everybody knows, I think vast majority of the family caregivers across the United States are, typically falls, that responsibility falls on the oldest daughter. You're seeing a couple of unicorns here with Greg and, and Kyle just proving that guys also end up taking care of their moms a lot of the time. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, our website is uh, stack, just stack stack.care and email info at stack.care and we'll be happy to provide more information and follow up with anybody. Excellent. Well, thanks again. Enjoy your day. And uh, thank you, Greg, Dr. Garner, and Nigel for, uh, for joining us. We look Absolute forward to it. Thank, thank you. you. Really enjoyed it. Hearing thanks good things about Stack here. All righty. Thanks. Uh, take care.